Decepticon. You having fun so far? Yes. You just got in, right? Yeah. You just got inside? There's lots and lots of people here. Lots of people in costumes. We took a picture with somebody in a costume, right? A Star Wars person? And you already have a free lollipop. Hey, Batman. Superheroes here. Yeah. And lots of comic books. Yeah, and stuffies. Take a picture with you? Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Look at all this cool stuff. Got a gremlin, they got a slimer. What is it? My, my little pony. Oh. It's a brick, it's a rock. For what? It's a rock. It's a brick. Okay. You can have it for three dollars. Uh what what do you what do you, you do with it? it? What do you do with it exactly? I think you're just putting the ground in, right? Do you know what that is, Alice? A brick. What do you do with it? Put it outside. 
Yeah. Oh, that's a cool stuff. Oh man, they have a Batman car seat. We should have got that for him. <laughs> the Gremlin is awesome. Yeah. Like more stuffies. Stuffies, stuffies. Is that fun? Stuffies. Ooh, swords. Should Daddy get a sword? Where? Over here. <laughs> I get a He Man power sword. Let's call our youngest fans who come to Terrificon this year. They're going to come walking out, they're going to line up in front of me, and they're going to show us all the cool costumes that they decided to wear at Terrificon. So start leading them out, it's Scout here. Would you tell us?
this big important man from New York who's a vice president and the head editor of DC Comics would call me up and yell at me for an hour every Thursday night right after the Batman TV show. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he's, you know, what's this supposed to be? Why can't you spell? What, you know, is this a gun or a carrot? I'm doing layouts, come on. You know, yeah. and uh, it, it, you know, it was like, uh, he was very harsh. I, I, uh, I, I thought it was just me, you know, I didn't know. I, didn't, I lived in Pittsburgh, I didn't know anybody else in the business. And then I went, to, but I would start going to the office to, for own business to, to visit, to occasional, be, occasionally be taught something or, or just have conferences or whatever. And uh, one time I saw him uh, to just, just torturing his assistant. And, and there, was a, there was a silly thing to it. And he was like, a, I started to realize, I said, that's just his MO. It's not me. You know, that's, 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 what, he, that's what he does. And so after that, I kind of let it roll off my back. You know, I still didn't argue with him or anything. I, mean, I just, I needed the money. You know? And, uh, um, but uh, he, was, uh, he was like that with everybody, apparently. Um, the apocryphal story is that at his funeral, they couldn't get anybody to, to do the eulogy. And finally, they found some guy who'd known him all his life, and he did, this is a probably apocryphal. He, he came up and he, he thought for a minute, he said, well, his brother was worse. <laughs> I would ask you, I'm going to just back it up just a little bit. There's an old radio guy, we're over modulating. But I don't know. No, you're good. And, but um, again, God, the Legion stuff. You created Feral Land, you created Princess Projector, you created Kar Karate Kid. Yeah. And I'm of that 70s generation that was reading the reprints in the 100 page spectaculars and the 80 page giants and all that stuff. And then when I found out years later, yeah, he was 13, I went to 14, I'm like, that's great because literally you were writing to your peers. Well, it was a unique situation. I don't, it'll never happen again. I, the, my monthly book, the one I did every month, was Adventure Comics featuring Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. And that was about teenage heroes in the future, right? Um, and uh, so here I was, I, I was the same age as my characters. And we up and up <clears throat> to a large extent the same age as the audience, right? And we all grew up together, and so that I could tell them when your character comes back in January, this is what's going to what's going to be like. I had to design everything. Yeah. Mike said I had to design everything way up front. So so uh, anyway, when I told the the Spider-Man team editor writer, he's going to come back in this black costume and, and explain how he got it and everything. They said, well, what do you want us to do with it? And I said, anything you want. And so they said, oh, man, maybe it could be an alien symbiote. I told them it was probably alive. I told them that much. Sure. And then they, they, they said, well, maybe it's a symbiote, you know? I thought that's probably not the most original idea I ever heard, but, but okay. <laughs> I mean, it didn't bring it, but I said, do anything you want, and the size just back off. And guess what? Yeah, it might not have been the most original idea, but they knocked it out of the park. I mean, they, 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 it was really cool the way they handled it, and, uh, and people loved it. 100%. You know? And, and so, so that was good. And like, uh, like I said, I tried to work with the guys. I, Chris Carlin had a, a storyline running in the X-Men where uh, Kitty Pride and Colossus are having this kind of forbidden romance. He's older, she's, she's young, you know? And it's uh, uh, just a romance, you know? No hanky panky. But um, anyway, uh, uh, so Chris, when he reads the plot for the whole series of Secret War, he says, this is going to take a while. I said, yeah, I didn't specify exactly how long they're going to be away, but yeah, it is substantial time. And he said, he said well, then you're going to have to address this storyline with Kitty and, and Colossus. I said, well, I guess so. He said, I wish you wouldn't do that. He said, I'd like to finish that myself. I said, okay, Chris, I'll leave Kitty home. He said, you do that for me? I said, sure. You know, and uh, I said, I'll throw this in. I'll have Colossus have a flame while he's on the battle world. He said, that plays into my hands. I said, you're welcome. Awesome. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, uh, you know, I tried to work with people and, 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 and coordinate it. John Byrne didn't want to cooperate at all. He said, I don't want to do this. You know? I said, well, that's too bad, John, because you have to. But I said, isn't there anything you want to do with the FF that you haven't been able to do yet? 
He said, well, he said, well, I'd really like to have the She-Hulk replace the thing for a while. I said, well, I'll leave the thing on Battle World. How's that? You know, and, and that's because he can change back and forth there. And, and he said, oh, wow. All of a sudden, I'm, it was his favorite thing. But so I, you know, I tried to, I tried to get along with everybody and, uh, and not, not be a total jerk about it. But anyway, sir. Well, I was just uh, wondering if you could speak to the, the fact that, you know, you being an editor and you're dealing with all these creative types and you're pulling in scripts and you're pulling in artwork. How did that work? I, did, Especially what, you know, Jim, that, and, and forgive me to build on that, um, that a lot of these guys have been doing it for a long time, and you're the new guy, and you may have new ideas as the editor. A lot of these writers and artists, well, certainly the writers, had already had a, a turn as an editor-in-chief. So yeah, how did all that work out? Well, it was it was uh, difficult, and you've heard the expression herding cats, but that's only half of it. It's like you said, all, a lot of these guys have been there a long time, I was the editor for two years first, and um, uh, no, they'd never even had an editor before. And so, you know, guys like Doug mentioned for the first time, somebody's looking at his plot and saying, Doug, this doesn't make sense. You know, and then he, he, he didn't want to hear it. Sure. And, and, uh, Roy with Conan? Uh, well, Roy, I didn't have a problem with Roy. Roy, okay. Roy is a great, <laughs> he's, a, he's a great writer. He is a great writer. Um, he was terrified, though, that, that some of these people who handle stuff in the office might not be good enough for him. And so he wanted to be his own editor. Yes. And uh, when I came in, I said, this writer editor stuff is, is bad because, you know, they all think they rule their little titles. And, yeah. and so the, then in their contrast, the boss was um, Stan or his designated person. And so Stan wrote them all letter designating me. So I'd have a the ability to control the situation. And so I was, that was not popular. Also when I came in, everything was late, and I was making great efforts to get things on time. And guys who had been living in, in anarchy for a long time, and no one editing them, no one telling them anything, no one, you know, sending in stuff late, and, and just, you know, missing deadlines all over the place. My first month there, of course, I, I'm taking over from the previous editor in chief, and um, uh, it's, um, Everything was late. In fact, in January 1978, it's my first month, January 1978, we were supposed to publish 45 color comics. Only 26 made it out the door. Wow! 26 out of 45. That's bad. All right? And the thing is, you schedule printing time. You schedule separating time. If that book doesn't show up, you pay anyway. And then when it does show up, you pay again. It's money, burning money like crazy. Okay, so I, I made it my business to get, get, get things on time. And, you know, when you're telling a writer, you know, no, we're going to have to take a book away from you because you have three of them and you're only delivering two a month. You know, and they're saying, you're cutting my income. You know, you only get paid for what you deliver. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, but there, you know, there was fear and loathing. And, uh, uh, but, we did get the books on time and they stayed on time for ten. Um, and, uh, uh, and because there was not been money being wasted at the printer and the engraver, uh, my deal with the president, I worked for the president, I reported to him, my deal with him was that if I beat my projections or if I save money, I could use that money. And he, he didn't think any, either of those things were possible. Sure. And so he said, I don't care what you do. You know, he said, do anything you want, just don't lose money. Because Marvel was losing about a million dollars a year before that. Um, and the, the magazine division, which is not like Conan, it, it was like uh, the, the men's magazines, the soap opera magazines, the puzzle books, they were losing two and a half million dollars. Jesus. That was Cadence, right? Well, it was all, it was all Marvel. Okay, yeah. And yeah, Marvel yeah. was owned by a, a, a conglomerate called Cadence. Okay. But the, that, that was part of Marvel. Sure. Yeah. And, um, but not just the black and whites, like you said. No, it had nothing to do with the comics. Okay. No, okay. Not, nothing to do with black and whites. Sure. It's like the men's sweat magazine. Oh, yeah. The men's adventure books. Yeah, absolutely. So books. I'm with you. You know, Mario Puzo worked for them for a while. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, uh, um, uh, he's just, just, you know, trying to lose money. Okay. It's pretty free hand. Uh, so I was able to plow that money back in, get people raises, start getting better people. And, and make better books, and better books sold better, and they came out on time, which is important, because you go to the store, and the, the book you want isn't there, 
It's really disappointing. You know, if, you, if, if I'm t I said, if somebody's coming to the store to get this book, you better be there. You know, and, uh, and there's no excuse, and you don't have to rush it. It's not about going fast or doing rush jobs. It's about just taking as much work as you can do with rare excellence. Walt Simonson always gave you his best. Archie Goodman always gave you his best. You, they didn't take more work than they could handle. And they, and they made what they did really good. So, so that's, that's what I wanted. I didn't want anybody to rush. I didn't want anybody to hurry. I didn't want anybody to have to hurry. Um, but, uh, so I, anyway, I was unpopular for a while because this, you know, I'm, you know, taking books away from people and to tell them they must be on time and all this. However, I started paying them lots more. Doubled the rates, doubled them again. Wow. Kept raising them. Introduced programs like you know, health insurance. Do three jobs a year. Freelancer. Three jobs a year. Health insurance. That's Good health insurance. Happened. Life insurance. Wow. Paid for all materials. Before that, they just provided the paper. I said, no, no, no. They won't let me change work for hire. But if it's work for hire, we, we provide all materials. Because you can't make the workers bring the leather to the shoe factory and claim you own the shoes. <laughs> you know, it, it's... You can't do this. So we provide pens, inks, brushes, but anything, whiteout, whatever. And if you go to try to buy a Windsor Newton brush, take a couple hundred bucks with you. So that was a good benefit. And I said, if you're sending something more, I'll pay you a postage. If you're calling business, I'll pay you a phone bill. Awesome. If, if, you, if I ask you to come to the office, uh, we'll pay your train fare. If I ask you to come from far away, we'll put you up in a hotel and feed you. You know, because I got this money by saving money, and then we started selling better, turned the corner, the direct market had just started, and it was starting to grow, so the whole market was growing, we were growing, rising tide lifted all the boats, it was a good time for comics. The direct market made a venue for small publishers like ElfQuest and Cerebus and all this. Um, but anyway, so, so at first they hated me, um, and then when they were all making money and had benefits and stuff, they liked me for a while. Uh, they got back to hating me later, don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, but things are good. So, so um, it wasn't the nightmare it might have been. It was because things were going pretty good. And also, Secret Wars sold tremendous numbers. And the books of the characters in Secret Wars, people who have never read, say, Iron Man, I say, eh, it's pretty cool. And they, they try Iron Man. And so the sales all went up. And it was, it was really nice. And, you know, it's like, that means you're pleasing more people. That means you're, you can pay these artists what they deserve, or a fraction of what they deserve. Uh, you can, you, can um, you know, swing for the fences. You can experiment. It's, things are going well. Yeah, we're a Marvel Comics. If we can't experiment, who can? So if you see some crazy stuff that we did back then, that's why. We did it because we could. <laughs> that's awesome. More questions? Because again, I can always go, sir, speak up. Um, why did they start hating me again? Why, why did they start hating me again? All right, well, see, we were too successful. We got to the point where we were 70% of the market. We're, we're doing really well. And the Cadence Board of Directors was an evil group of financial weasels. And uh, so, uh, and for years, Marvel had been losing money. And all of a sudden, it's making money. Well, none of these guys are asked or open a book or try to figure out why. They thought it was Hulu, so they thought it was a fad. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they had deliberately depressed the price of Cadence stock. Uh, the way they did that was the only company in their crummy little conglomerate that was doing well was us. All right? So they made us a division rather than a subsidiary, not to get too technical. But basically, they could lay off all the corporate expenses against us, all their fat cat salaries. And so it didn't look like Marvel was making all that much money. Because well, you don't have to report a, a division separately. It could be reported as part of the company. So, so to the SEC, I'm talking. And so, uh, so they kind of deliberately made it look worse than it was. And they depressed the price of the stock. And this is the board of directors screwing the shareholders. So then they make an offer to buy back all the stock. And they succeed. And then six, six men own Cadence Industries, including Marvel. And they were, they had, for the first couple of years, they were selling off you know, per, perfect.
Perfect Subscription Company and U.S. Pen and Pencil and Vitamin Quota and all these other crappy companies. And then they came to the Crown Jewel Mart. And uh, we were really on a high. And they had no faith that it would go farther. <laughs> they thought, better get out, what they're getting is good. And so they tried to sell them. You know, when you're selling a company and you're evil and greedy, um, you, you don't want to invest anymore. And furthermore, you want to cut costs, because every penny you put on the bottom line means you get like a, a quarter or 50 cents back when you sell the company. Because companies like Marvel are sold for a multiple of what's on the bottom line. All right? You can get a multiple of 20, 25, 30, you know? So every time they save a penny or, 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 or we made an extra penny, you know, their, their, their stake got richer. And, uh, and so what they started doing is cutting the programs that I put in there. They, they eliminated our pension plan, the cash today. They got rid of the 401k, first the matching and then the 401k all together. Then they, uh, they, they, they eviscerated our health insurance. Instead of being really good health insurance, it became a crummy HMO that nobody took and you had to pay for. And, and so on, all right, you get the truth. And I was upstairs fighting with these guys every day. They wanted to cancel the royalty program. And that's the one fight I won. That's the wow. one fight I won. Because I convinced them that you can't do it because they want to do it retroactively, just sudden, suddenly stop paying. And I got a screaming argument with the president, the financial officer, and uh, who else? Oh, the executive vice president. A screaming argument with these guys in the, in the hallway outside the president's office. Yeah. And, and we're, we're, uh, I'm telling you, I'm gonna, we're gonna quit, I'm gonna go and find a lawyer, we're gonna have a class action too, we're gonna sue your ass. And, and, uh, and the lawyer, the company counsel, his office was right around that area too. So he comes out, and he, he turns to the three guys I'm arguing with. He says, gentlemen, he's right. <laughs> this goes back to his office. So that's a one fight out of one. But, but they were just killing us. And of course, a lot of it is blamed on me. You know, it's like, it's like, well, wait, isn't this your area? You're supposed to take care of this, you know? And, and, and what am I going to do? If I tell the guys, the upstairs people are screwing you, then they all quit and go to D.C. and it's Jim Shooter's drying talent away, you know? Uh, God, you know, so anyway, I, was, I, I, was, I thought, just, I'll, I'll fight it as hard as I can, and uh, maybe I can prevent some things from going wrong, and maybe the new owners will be better. They were worse. Actually, there were this is New World, am I right? New World Pictures, which okay. changed its name to New World Entertainment. Yes. And and so I I forced them to fire me. Basically, what I did is I I, I ratted them out. I, I told the new owners where the bodies were buried. And uh, the CEO of New World came to my office and he said, "Every word you told us is true." He said, "We find that these people are weasels. They're all corrupt as hell." And they don't know what they're doing. They, you know, they all drowned in the East River. No one would notice. Them, like, you know, and, uh, and he, they said, "But we're a publicly traded company, and we can't just suddenly fire the executive staff of a company we we bought for a whole bunch of money." <laughs> he said, "So we're going to fire you." I says, "Okay, that's fine. I'm tired of this place." And uh, so he said, "But don't worry. He said, we're going to set you up in your own business." We're you know, that's how we do it in Hollywood. They, you fire a studio chief, next thing you know, he has his own independent production company. The studio pays for his staff, and, and he makes movies, and then the studio distributes them. And so we're going to do that with you. And, um, but the people that I ratted out were really mad at me. And, um, and they dug their heels in. And the thing is that Bob Raymond, the CEO of the other company, he, he, he wasn't going to go to the mat for me. I mean, you know, and so they. Uh, I, I, I was fired, that was the end of that. And then uh, I was glad to get out of there. I went and started down there. Yeah. And then I ate their lunch. I, I went from zero to 17% of the market in one year. And uh, most of that came out of Marvel's hide. It's, it's no wonder to this day they don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, anyway. Corporations don't forget. I've had, and I've had that experience in broadcasting, so I know what you mean. And again, and, and please, I know they're going to tell us, like, stop soon because we're less than five minutes. But if you don't mind, oh, is there one more question, please? No, that was the, that's okay, all right. the keepers are right there. Oh, no, and I realize that. But, if, you know, if we go a little bit over, because if you will, just, just for Absolutely. a couple of minutes, sure. talk value. Uh, because, obviously, big chapter, 
the big next chapter. Yeah, it's another story of evil, greedy bankers, I guess. But but basically, I started Valiant, and then we were we you know, started at zero, and then, you know, they, it's like that old joke they laughed when I sat down to play. I mean, Marvel was doing Marvel was taking full page ads, and the buyers guy mocking us. Okay, and, uh, and you know, like when we did the flip book, they mocked us. Um, six months later, they did flip books. <laughs> When I did the all black solar cover, um, uh, they, they ridiculed us. The full page ad in the buyer's guide to, to ridicule us. And within six months, they had an all, all white book, an all red book, and an all black book. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, yeah, you make fun of us, and then you do it. Okay? Yeah. So, I mean, I, they, I, I really, you know, we, we were doing some, I had, I had kids out of the Cuban school, we didn't have anyone. The kids out of the keyboard school, and I had some old guys that nobody else wanted. You can't, you mean nobody wants Stan Drake? No. Jesus. Because work. I was going to let him get yeah. one. Wow. John Dixon, Ernie Colon, yeah. Steve Ditko, uh, Ralph Reese, um, Don Perlin. These are masters guys. Yeah, yeah, and they were great. Yeah. So I had the old guys who knew what they were doing, and the young kids who were cuties, and Joe taught them to be professional, and they listened to the old guys. Great school. And they were getting better and then better. And uh, we, we, everyone else is doing flashy art and thin stories. And I said, that's what we have to fight back with the story. We're going to outstory these guys. Just outwork them 100%. And uh, <clears throat> like I said, it worked. It was, in, in a year, we were 17% of the market and shooting up, going up. And Marvel was coming down. And uh, they were peeved about it. So peeved, in fact, that when I started my, uh, well, value, what happened to uh, my, my Evil partner married the banker, and between the two of them, they controlled the board of directors. You people wonder why I did Nintendo comics because my my partner who married the banker, he was a lawyer and he represented Nintendo for media and entertainment, and so he made a deal with himself. Both sides of the table, he makes a deal with himself, right? He gets a big fat fee, and now I'm doing Nintendo books. And if I if I threw a fit. Quit. Well, then Don Perlin's on the street, J.J. Jackson, all my friends who came and worked for the pariah of comics and therefore were blacklisted, um, they wouldn't be able to get a job. So I thought, well, I'll just do as, what, as good as I can and I'll try to, if I can make money with these things, then I can raise money and buy this turkey out. That's what he wants. He wants money, you know? And so Nintendo, I, I couldn't, I, we did the business. Couldn't make it happen, and uh, and then guess who else he represented? World Wrestling Federation. So now I'm doing wrestling comics. He makes a deal with himself, gets a fat fee, hundreds of thousands, and um, you know he was just trying. He never had any faith in the comics. He was just trying to get as much money out as he could. Sure. And uh, so uh, so that didn't work. Yet. He did the best he could. It didn't work. And finally, he ran out of clients. And so uh, I, I got to do my superheroes that I had licensed from Richard Bernstein, me. I licensed the uh, Del Gold Key characters from him. Um, he tried to buy Marvel once and he interviewed me a few times. He interviewed all the executives. The last interview he had with me, he said, these people don't know their product, they don't know their business. He said, they don't work. He said, none of these departments is making money except, you know, the publishing. He said, I think I'm buying you and a bunch of used furniture. He didn't mean me, he meant us, the publisher. And, um, uh, and, and so, uh, so anyway, after, after I left there and I needed a gig, I went to him and I said, you got some great characters. And he agreed to license them to me. I didn't have the money at the time. He said, I'll hold them for you. He held them two years. Wow. He got big offers from Marvel, DC, and other people, Dark, Dark Horse. Uh, but he, he was holding them for me. And I used to get a call from his licensing guy every week. You're going to do this? You sure you're going to do this? I could be making all this money. And I said, No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And, uh, and I did. You know, like I said, I picked pick bad partners, but um, a bad partner. Uh, but uh, you know, for a while, we did we when we did the superheroes. It went really, you know, fighting with uh, what we had. Um, that's why I was writing it. I couldn't afford to pay anyone. Um, and, uh, you know, we started work, and we started to get good. And then, of course, they shopped the company behind my back. And it got ugly, and long story short, uh, 
I, I, I made them fire me <laughs> again, so I could get out with, with uh, you know, uh, not, not severance, so but at least the rest of my contract. And uh, then, I, I, so I started a new company, and guess what I called it? Defiant. <laughs> Good name. And, uh, you know, and that, that, that went well too. The, the, the trouble there was the market collapse. Yes, yes. And, and the, not only the market collapse, but Marvel sued me for, I had a comic con called Plasma, and I get a call from Terry Stewart, he says, I have to sue you for this. I said, why? He said, it's too close to one of ours. I said, I have looked everywhere, there's no, nothing close to that. And he said, he said, well, we, have, we don't have the property yet, we don't have it made, but we have the name registered with intent to use in uh, UK, which is why I didn't turn on my search. They registered the name, they had nothing to go with it yet, registered the name Plasmer, Plasmer. And I said, Terry, you've got a Black Knight, DC's got a Black Knight. You've got Wonder, Wonder Man, they've got Wonder Woman. You've got Power Man, they've got Power Girl. Don't tell me this is too close. And he said, oh no, Jim, want to sue you. Yeah, well they did, and it killed a, a, a $9 million guaranteed toy deal I had with Mattel because we missed our window. And then it cost me $300,000 to win. And not only did we win, to get the temporary injunction, which is what they were after, you had to win every point of three categories. They lost every point of three categories. My tough little Irish lady lawyer beat up six of their you know, corporate, guys. corporate guys. And uh, they lost the whole thing. And the judge calls them up to the stand of the lawyers, and he covers the mic, because you can still hear him. He said, uh, he said, if you ever use, use my court as a business weapon again, you will regret it. Wow. And, and then he says, you will not appeal. You will withdraw the suit, or you will really, really regret it. Wow. <laughs> and say, Marvel withdrew the suit. Because you know, if they don't withdraw the suit, then, then it's it's without prejudice, that means they can sue you again. Right, right. And so uh, but they withdrew the suit. And but the trouble is at that point, I lost my ten million dollar toy deal, lost my uh, uh, three hundred thousand dollars for for legal fees and stuff, and I lost a whole bunch of time that I should have been working. And, and so they got what they wanted. They put us out of business. You know, before we could eat another 17% of their market share. So. Jim, I mean, what an amazing journey of your career. We gotta, we gotta wrap up for because there's another panel coming. Yeah. But truly, thank God, so much of your leg legacy is indoors. I gotta tell you something. All that bad stuff I just talked about, <clears throat> nonetheless, it's been a good ride. 100%. Absolutely. And seriously, we've been appreciative of being along with the ride. And again, your body of work speaks for itself. I will ask later on, and uh, maybe a separate little we'll, we'll podcast, what you've got coming next. I'm glad you're writing. All right, good. Yeah, and, and, and anytime you want, to, if anyone wants to hear more about any of this or any other horror stories, or you want me to talk about the good things, come to those tables. Come to my table. Hundred percent. Chip Shooter. Everybody. Thank you.